I want to welcome you to the 2016 hack demo for security awareness training. In past demos, we've focused on remote attacks to gain access to accounts, systems, and networks using things like phishing emails, getting people to click on links to run code to give us access to their system and their accounts. Attachments, tempting people to enable macros that run code that give us the same type of access. Or taking advantage of the fact that either their operating system, their browser, or most likely a browser plugin like Adobe Flash is unpatched so that when they visit the website that we want them to visit, their browser is exploited and we obtain remote access to their system in that manner. This year we want to focus on physical means as a way to obtain access to user accounts, systems, and networks. There's more than one way into a network. This is a really interesting example. Using drone technology to hover in the proximity of a building in order to break into a corporate network through their Wi-Fi. It's a very interesting example of physical access to gain access to systems and networks. But what we want to focus on today is things like USB keys, CD-ROMs in the parking lot, stuff that arouses curiosity. People think, hey, somebody dropped their USB key. We need to find out who it belongs to. So we're going to insert it into our system, or we're going to look around in the file system, maybe open up some files so we can identify the owner and get it back to them. Of course, another way of doing this is putting a CD-ROM in the parking lot, marking it as a reorganization plan, and seeing how many people can resist putting that in their computer. People are driven by curiosity, and we can use use that curiosity to gain access to their accounts, systems, and networks. Another great way to get access is through physical infiltration of facilities. A buddy of mine, Jason Street, he's hired by companies all over the world to test their physical security and see how far he can get inside their building without being noticed and what systems he can get access to. Here he's pictured being a helpful tech support technician behind a bank counter and nobody noticed that he was not supposed to be there. So today we're going to use USB keys to run code on a system that we want to get access to in pretty much the same way we would do if we were to use a phishing attempt. But here's what I think is really cool about today's demo. Malware and exploits really aren't necessary to get inside of networks. The easiest way to get inside of a network is through the human. I know professional pen testers, people who test the security of networks, who haven't used an exploit in years because it's so easy to get access to a network by exploiting the human. But the really cool thing about today is that we're going to use in our exploits a legitimate Windows tool called Windows PowerShell. Windows PowerShell has been around for a long time and you can do almost anything on a Windows system or network using Windows PowerShell. You can manage control and query Active Directory, Exchange, SCCM, and because it's so powerful, it's a lot like the Force. It can be used for both good and for evil, and today we're going to use it for evil. And since we're using legitimate Windows tools, and we're running that legitimate code in memory so that it never touches disk, antivirus doesn't see it, it doesn't care, and we're able to do whatever we want on these systems quite easily. So we're going to go in and we're going to steal and use legitimate accounts, and we're going to abuse misconfigurations on this network to get access to the data and information that we want. And we're going to do this very quietly and under the radar. So before we get started with the actual demo, it's really important to remember that the purpose of demonstrations that show limitations in technology is to help us remember that we can't rely on the technology that we have available to us on our computers to allow us to do whatever we want. We have to be responsible. We cannot rely on our technologies to be able to stop everything that's going to come our way. The best antivirus that we have as humans is our brain to make the appropriate decisions to analyze and be suspicious. So for today, what we're going to use is one of these to get inside of the systems and networks that we want to get into. And there's a couple of ways we can do this. We can drop them in the parking lot or even drop it in a public area in their facility. Or better yet, we can walk up to the front desk and we can say, I'm so sorry, but I spilled 
coffee all over my resume and I really need your help because I have an interview in a few minutes. Can you please help me? I just need to plug this in and print it out. And in doing so, we can get access in that manner as well. Now you say to me, Dan, Windows doesn't automatically run files on USB keys anymore. And while that may be true, this particular USB key is not your typical USB key. This USB key has a chip inside and that chip emulates a Windows keyboard. And so what happens when you plug it into a Windows system is that Microsoft recognizes it as a keyboard and so Microsoft Windows happily loads the keyboard driver for us and then expects what from a keyboard? It expects typing. And so we're able to program this chip so that when it gets plugged into a system it will type for us the code that we want to run on that system that will give us remote access to that computer as we need it. And so that's what we're going to do today. So here we go. Here we are. This is the victim system and either the victim is putting the USB key in their drive or we have access to the victim system and we're doing that instead. And normally what you would see next, we try to hide from the victim, but in this particular case I left it up so you could see exactly what's going on. Once the USB key is inserted, it starts typing and we can see that we're running a PowerShell command and that PowerShell command is actually encoded and what it's doing is it's telling this system to phone home to our attacker's system wherever we are in the world. Meanwhile, back on our attacker's system, we get a connection from that system. And we're going to rename that connection to victim. And we're going to interact with that system and get a lot of information about it. In this particular case, we can see a few different things. We can see that we are logged into this system as the same account as the victim. It's a domain account. We can see that we are running PowerShell on the system and we are running in a Microsoft Windows 10 Pro system, which happens to be fully up to date with enterprise antivirus. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to see if this particular user is careless enough that they're running their account as an administrator on their machine, that they're doing their day-to-day -day computing with elevated privileges. Because if they are, it makes it really easy for us to bypass that Windows prompt that says, are you sure you want to do this? And we can do that really quickly and we have a brand new connection from that same system and this time that connection gives us full control. Meanwhile, back on our victim's computer, everything's just fine. There's no warnings, there's no alerts, there's no antivirus messages. The user has no idea that we're on their system. They're just checking out kitten memes for security awareness emails, of course. So we're going to interact with this machine as a full-blown administrative account, and we're going to do what we like to do on every system we get on. We want to steal some passwords. So in this case, we're going to steal the password hash from this particular user. And if this particular user has a weak password, we should be able to pretty easily crack that password by putting in our password cracker offline. But the other thing that's very interesting is we can also steal other passwords on the system that sit in memory. In this case, we have the Windows Credential Manager. Oftentimes, when Windows prompts you to save passwords, it will store them in the Windows Credential Manager, and in many cases, those passphrases or passwords and other account information is easily reversible in memory. So here we have a valid account on a domain and a nice long passphrase in clear text. Now, this is a really important slide because this represents protected information. It's information that many government agencies access, and you can replace the icons on this screen with the agencies or databases that your organization uses that houses protected information, information you would not want to have end up in an attacker's hands or have written about in the newspaper. And you can replace these icons with your personal icons, such as your bank, your credit card, your own personal tax returns, your own personal health information, 
And the last thing we want to do is give an attacker easy access to these things if they've gotten a foothold on our computer. And so if we are using the same user ID and password to get access to this really important stuff that we use to log into our computer on a day-to-day -day basis, we've made it super easy on an attacker. They can easily move and get access to the same information that you have access to. On the other hand, the goal is to make passwords to these important sites useless to an attacker by enabling two-factor authentication, enabling the two-step authentication that then makes the password by itself worthless. So if our password does get stolen from memory, it makes it much harder for the attacker to be able to access that information. And since in our instance here that is not the case, we're going to install a keylogger using Windows PowerShell and steal login information. In this particular case, this particular user is using Internet Explorer to access fidelity.com and we have their long password. This is my long passphrase for access to PII exclamation point. So as we wrap this up, there are so many things we could do and so much we could steal with the account that we already have on this network. But we can also go and dig deeper and go for the crown jewels. And how would we do that? We do that by asking Active Directory. Active Directory is a database of users and groups and computers and all kinds of information about a company's environment. And as a valid user on this network, we can ask it anything and it'll tell us. So we can ask it who the domain administrators are, the most powerful accounts within Active Directory. And then we can ask it where those domain administrators may be logging in and see if we can lateral over to those machines and gain access to those systems and then see if we can steal their password from there. Because if we gain access to those accounts, then we have a badge that looks just like this. But one of the more interesting attacks that I really like is actually demonstrated in a different video. It involves taking service tickets. The services that we use on the network, like say for example our file server or our SharePoint server or our database server, and asking Active Directory for tickets to those servers, and instead of handing those tickets off to those servers to get access to them, take those tickets offline because those tickets are encrypted with the passwords of those service accounts. And if we can crack those passwords, then we get access to all those services with no restrictions whatsoever. So for the final portion of our attack today, we're going to do something a little different. We're just going to go after the service desk because we think it's an interesting place to gather information and a place where we might be able to find out a whole lot of interesting stuff about this organization. But first, in order to do that, we need to know who works at the service desk so that we can get access to their machine and begin to spy on what goes on there. So how are we going to do that? Well, the easiest way is to simply make a phone call. Hello, yes, service desk. Uh, I'm calling because I'm having a problem with my, my system. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got another call on the line. Can I, can I call you right back? And, and your name is Courtney Brewster. Thank you very much. And so we have a name. Now what do we do? We ask Active Directory. So we're going to set our username to Brewster, since we have that part, and we're going to run and ask Active Directory who this person is, and there they are. There's a real account that we can use. So then we're going to ask Active Directory again something else. We're going to set that username appropriately and we're going to ask Active Directory where this person logs in so we can get a machine name and there it is. So now that we have a machine name we're going to use the account that we have and we're going to laterally move over to that machine and we're going to get a brand new connection from Courtney's machine that now we can rename it to her last name, we can interact with that machine, and we can do all kinds of stuff from here. But just for fun, to finish up, let's turn on her webcam. And there's Courtney working at the service desk, and you can see we can easily spy on her. And one of the reasons why is because the account we already have has administrative rights on her machine as well. It made it easy for us to do what we want to do. By the way, that's uh, Courtney Brewster. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter at TechieLangaGirl. So that's the end of our hack demo for today, and I hope you enjoyed it. Take care.